Welcome back to Grace Class. This is my third time trying to do this, and I've been a little bit surprised at how many of you are turning in, and, and I hope listening, but I hope it's not to me, but that you are listening uh, to what God's Word has to say and separate anything out that I say that shouldn't be there. I'm, I'm, I'm trusting that God is overseeing that so that that doesn't happen for me. Uh, that I just stick to uh, what God wants us to hear. You know, last week uh, we looked at Psalm 23, and the goal was to look at the whole verse, and it didn't happen, and I sort of knew from recording that it wouldn't happen. Um, you can really dig deep and, and think long when you just take this a little bit at a time. And so last week we only looked at uh, the first phrase, the Lord is my shepherd. And we thought about who the Lord is, and he is this creator God who is greater than everything and, quite frankly, can be intimidating and uh, needs to be respected with reverential awe and fear, and so we can be afraid to approach him. But then in that same phrase, he said, shepherd. And all that that entails, and that's really what we are looking at in this entire psalm, is David said, the Lord is my shepherd. He's the one that's watching over me. He's the one that's going to uh, lead me where I need to go. And boy, as I move forward in my studying, trying to prepare these lessons, it's like, oh, I got to get there. But, you know, we're going to take our time and, and seek to get there in the Lord's timing so that we have the opportunity uh, when we're in class. And again, I invite you, if you are not attending a Sunday school class, if you're not attending church anywhere in particular, that you would join us at Catawba Springs. Uh, we are meeting at 930 in the old church auditorium. And, uh, you know, my numbers are are small, uh, but it's what the Lord has for us. Those are who are able to come. Some are working security, obviously. So I hope that they're listening. But again, many more are, are at least checking it out. Maybe you're not listening to the whole thing, but again, I hope you would uh, just to be reminded of all that uh, Psalm 23 has for us in the way of offering us instruction on God and who he is and how our relationship can be even greater. Uh, so as we go into today, we're going to take that second phrase of Psalm 23. Uh, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And I got to thinking about, okay, if I break up the verse here, how long can I possibly go on that simple phrase? And, and the more I've looked into it and the more things I've seen and want to share, it's like, okay, how can now I do it in 30 minutes, which is uh, really where I want to limit myself uh, so that I know that what I need to say now, I'll be able to also uh, be sure to share in the Sunday school class as well. So we invite you to come. Uh, if you're coming to the Sunday school class, you can listen and reinforce, but I'm trying to cover the same things. My question for us when we got into this part of the verse was, how do you describe the difference between wants and needs in your life? You know, what do you think about God's care and grace for you when you are struggling with your wants and your needs? Um, I know that with our, our grandchildren, and I would imagine we did it with the girls, but I'm getting kind of old now and don't always remember, but um, I know taking the grandchildren at times or, or having them in the house and they see a commercial, they're just typical children. I want, I want. I said, it's okay to like, but you don't have to say I want. And we... And they pretty much are very good about it. They they have already learned, and but they're still children, and it does come out. But, you know, I'm just sometimes a big child myself. There are things that I'm convinced that I want, and therefore because I want it, I need it, and that's not really what David is saying at all here. I shall not want. Now, he's not denying the fact that there are needs, uh, again, uh, Herbert Lockyer, who I used last week, uh, said this about it. He was quoting from an old Scotch lady, and she said, what more do I want? And recently, I came across uh, a message that uh, Stephen Davy had preached, and 
In it, he was describing a similar quote. He said one little boy was quoting the verse to his teacher, and he got the words turned around. And he said, the Lord is my shepherd, and that's all I want. It's a pretty good way to turn it around, isn't it? Um, you know, Keller, when we're looking at his book, he said, he titled the chapter, I Shall Not Be in Want. So the main concept uh, there is that we're not lacking in proper care or management, you know, when we think of ourselves in terms of being like the sheep, okay? But another idea that's totally uh, there is uh, being contented in the good shepherd's care, therefore I don't wish for anything more. I came across an, a lady named Christina Patterson, and she blogs at BelovedWomen.org. So, ladies, perhaps that's someone you could look at for, for more uh, devotional kinds of statements and, and things. But she defined want as simply to lack, decrease, empty, or run dry. I'm not going to lack. I'm not going to become empty. I'm not going to run dry. Wow. You know, Matthew 6 reminds us of this because God told us, how he cares for the smallest of creatures and their needs. And if he cares for the smallest of creatures and their needs, he's going to care for my needs. And so I don't have to worry about that. But that isn't to say I don't have challenges in life. It isn't to say that I'm not in need of things. And again, we're calling this grace class. And one of the things I need to remember is that I'm in need of God's grace. He makes it available, but I'm in need of even his help to claim that grace. And that's part of what we want to, to see as we continue to study God's word. Yeah. Um, so David, when he is saying, I shall not want, he's really saying two things. There are areas in my life that only God can fulfill. And he will fulfill them. And also that David is saying now, I've made the decision not to desire anything outside of the scope of what God wants for me. How are you and I doing at that? How am I doing? Do, can, can I get to that place? Am I at that place where, okay, you know, I really don't want anything that God doesn't want for me to have. And at the moment, I'm sitting in a pretty nice office uh, that I have to say that I can give Pat the credit for letting me have it. Like, wow, you know, I have my own space. I've closed myself off from the rest of the world. Now, nobody's at home with me right now. I don't have to, but it looks better with the door closed. And for those of you that are behind me, you might not be a Carolina fan. You know, that's okay. But I have plenty, and it could say that, well, there are a lot of wants that have been met, not just needs. But my concern should be, and my realization should be, yes, I have needs, but God's always going to be there to meet those needs. But David himself in his own life um, and things that happened remind us that he had some needs. Remember the struggles, and, and he's writing this, even prior to some of these things happening, but through his life, it probably never changed that he'd say, I shall not want. But I mean, this is a young man who found himself running from Saul through no fault of his own. He found himself running from his son Absalom for a while. And, you know, I've been to some of those places where he went to run. And they weren't running to a vacation spot. They weren't running to the, the best of areas. He was running into mountainous areas and hilly areas that had very dry areas and not a lot of water and a lot of little caves. But he was going and getting away from the problem of who is after him. So he had the need it wasn't that everything was going rosy and perfect. And, you know, Christ reminds us that in this world, we're going to have trouble. We're going to have difficulty. 
and we are in need of him. You know, in Revelation chapter 3, uh, verses 17, 18, it's in part of the letter that uh, Christ had sent to the church at Laodicea. And listen to what he said. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. You know, the church at Laodicea said, I've got it made. I've got everything I don't need most of all, God. And he says, you don't even realize your situation. You need to think about where you really are and what you really need. And if you did, look at verse 18. He said this, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. You've got needs, Laodicea. I've got needs. And that need is a relationship with Jesus Christ. And not to try to do things on my own. But the interesting thing is, what I need from him, his grace, he says, here it is, and I want to give it to you abundantly above what you could ask or think, and you don't do it. And if I take my eyes off myself and I look around at others, I'll oh, shame on them. I'll oh, shame on Israel that they didn't see God's grace and enter the promised land sooner. And, and no, I see me. I see me in those same situations that I've not been any different. Grace is abundantly promised to me, open and offered to me, and I sit back and I take a little bit, and a little bit, but no. Things that aren't so good for me, oh man, I'm just going, let's pile those things on, let's come on more, more, more. But it's the wrong things. And that was the church of Laodicea. That's what they were doing. In Mark chapter 10 and verse 21, there's the young man who comes to Christ and asks of Christ what he should do. And in verse 21, Christ said, Beholding him, loved him. Boy, he had compassion for this young man. He wanted to see him do the right thing. But he immediately put his finger on the thing that was in the way. Then Jesus beholding him, loved him and said unto him, one thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast and give to the poor. And thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come, take up the cross and follow me. Now we know if we follow the story that it says the young man went away sorrowful because he had a lot of possessions and he wasn't ready to give up his wants for what he needed. What about you and me? Would I give up my wants for what I needed? And it's easy for me to sit here and talk to this camera and ask that question. It'll be easy for me to stand in front of people tomorrow and ask that question. But am I personally dealing with the answer? Am I willing for it to all go away to have only what I need? Now Keller, as he's speaking of this uh, part of the, the verse, he reminds us about the difference between the owner shepherd and the tenant shepherd. And even scripture speaks of, of this to a certain extent. Christ speaks of it. Um, you know, the owner is going to give himself over completely to the care of his sheep. He's constantly looking after them. And what is it that they need? And I want to meet that need so they are as healthy as possible. And we're going to, as we move forward, we're going to see the things that get in the way of a sheep being able to lie down and, and be comfortable and how that fits with us. 
But that owner cares deeply for his sheep and wants to meet all those needs. But you get into the, the hired servant, the, the tenant shepherd, and he's got a job to do. And in Bible times, you know, that job was all the time. If he's been hired to do it, the shepherd's out there all the time, but um, he's not caring very much. Oh the, oh, the sheep got in some mud. Oh, that's too bad. Oh, they, they don't have much to, to forage on. Oh, well, you know, hey, I'm, I'm comfortable where I'm at. I don't feel like moving. I don't feel like getting them to fresh water. You know, they can drink from those puddles. And these are all things that, uh, as we go ahead with the study, we're going to look at and the problems that these things cause. But the tenant shepherd doesn't care so much. He's just going to take care of himself first. He's not interested in meeting the needs of his flock. So what about us? Um, what kind of shepherd are we looking to follow? Because when the difficult times come, and they do come, for the sheep, for us, the owner shepherd it stays right there. His first goal is to take care of his sheep. Remember the, the shepherd who lost one and yet he had 99 that were safe. And he goes out to find the one because he wanted to know that one was all right. The tenant shepherd, the predators come, the, the storms come, they're running. Remember David, we know from his own life that when he wanted to face Goliath and Saul doubted him, that he told Saul, look, I take care of my father's sheep. And there was a bear that came. I took care of that bear. There was a lion that came. I took care of that lion because I was the shepherd who had to take care of my flock to meet their need. And in that case, that need of safety, I didn't run. I face the difficulty. And so he says, I'll face this difficulty of Goliath because I'm not going to go in my own strength. I'm going to go in the strength of the Lord. What about you and I again? What kind of shepherd do we want watching over us? Do I want to follow that shepherd that is there to meet all my needs? He's going to take care of me. Or if I'm going to make myself my shepherd. Oh, I can do it. I can handle it. I'm like the church at Laodicea. I'm in need of nothing but myself and I can handle it. Look back on your life. I can look back on mine. At times when I may have acted like that. How'd it go for you? Was it a successful venture? Probably not. You know, we, we tend to, to stumble and fall at that point. And God allows us to do so because he wants to catch our attention. Hey, don't go out there and do it without me. You know, the shepherd that I belong to, the shepherd that you belong to, is going to make all the difference in our destiny. I know Jesus Christ is my personal Savior. I know I'm going to go to heaven one day because I've trusted in his finished work on Calvary. But what about this journey right now that I'm finishing? I don't know. I have one day, two days, you know, 30 more years. I don't want to overestimate here. You know, I'm not God. I, I don't know what amount of time I have left, but I can pretty much safely assume that I'm more than halfway there. And I can look back and I can continually see how the shepherd met the needs. But I can also look back and see times when I didn't listen closely to my shepherd and wonder how often that was more of the time than not. 
So who is that shepherd that, that you're following? You know, I asked you to uh, consider another question. Uh, can you say, can I say with the Apostle Paul that you've learned to be content regardless of your circumstances? You know, Keller said this, contentment should be the hallmark of the man or woman who has put his, his or her affairs in the hands of God. I remember some years ago now um, when my mother was dealing with uh, lung cancer and I think she knew uh, that she wasn't going to get over it and that it was, you know, going to, to be the end of her earthly life. But she made the comment, and keep in mind that she became a widow at 38, so there were, there were difficulties earlier in her life, and now she's 65 and barely had time to enjoy retirement, uh, still relatively young grandchildren, some are getting up into high school years, but still not, not all that old. And... She said, I don't have any regrets. I wouldn't change anything. She knew contentment. I didn't see a color TV in my house until I came home one year from college. And the only reason it came was because the old black and white that I grew up seeing my entire life had finally died. She was content. This thing works. I don't, I don't need anything more. Um, and probably to reach the point where if we were going to see anything where we lived, you had to have cable. Because our town was down in a valley kind of area and you hardly, you know, rabbit ears didn't pick up much. She was content. Um content with where she was in life. Um, and that's an example for me. Um, but am I demonstrating that same contentment? You know, I need to remember, as Keller reminds us, what the Good Shepherd's constantly doing. He's always alert to the welfare of his flock. That Good Shepherd that Keller's talking about being He's out there constantly watching over his sheep. You know, he's, he's looking across the flock. He's counting heads. He knows each one by name. And, okay, how is that one doing? How is that one doing? And where is that one? And, and are there any predators around? And what are the conditions of the field and the water? And all these things we're going to see as we continue in the song. The shepherd's always paying attention. He's always examining them, and constantly during the day, not just, okay, I did my duty this morning, I'm done. No, it's looking after them constantly. You know, he mentioned a story that he gave of a personal experience. And he had a sheep that he called Mrs. Gadabout. And Mrs. Gadabout kept getting out. The grass was always greener in another field, even when it wasn't. There was always somewhere she wasn't supposed to be that she wanted to be. And it got so bad, he would go and get her, bring her back. But it got so bad that she was starting to lead other sheep. And they were following her and making the same mistake and going where they didn't belong. And finally, Keller had to do the difficult thing of a shepherd because he really did love his sheep and he loved this one but he couldn't get the behavior stopped and he had to butcher her to prevent her from continuing to lead other sheep away. Are we content, he says, are we like fence crawlers? Are we looking through the fence 
Are we always thinking something, the grass is greener on the other side, there's something better if I just am I content? You know, as I wrap this up, a couple of quotes that I want to share. Stephen Davies said about this, and when the Lord is your shepherd, the one who needs nothing is omnisciently capable of knowing and then delivering what he knows you need. So you can say at any given moment in life, whatever I don't have, God knows it isn't something I need to have. And whatever I do have, God knows for whatever reason, I needed to have it. Christina Patterson, the, the blogger from Beloved Women, said, we may not have all we desire, but we trust that God is providing for us every single day. We may not receive the recognition we want, but we trust God sees us and knows exactly where we are. We may be struggling, but we know God will not place on us more than we can bear. We may be struck down, heartbroken, in despair, but we trust that the God of the universe has never left our side. This comes to my last question, and it really ties it together. My question is, how great is the grace of God that he would shepherd me and you? You think about it. Christina Patterson talked about this trusting God. When I trust God, then I'm able to enter into this room of grace. And in this room of grace, I know that whatever I need, he's going to meet that need. When I'm going through the difficulties and, and I'm needing encouragement, he's going to give me encouragement. He might give it to me through you. He is going to uh, give me help in knowing uh, how to make a decision. And he'll use his word, his Holy Spirit. And again, he may use, may use you. That grace of God that reaches me can calm anything, can calm our spirits. Are we overwhelmed? Are we struggling? Are we not having our eyes on our shepherd? Because if I truly believe the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want for what I don't need. And I'm going to know that I'll have the things that I do need. He'll equip me for what he wants me to do. He'll provide for me what I need in the times of difficulty, in the times of joy. Where am I in this relationship with my shepherd? Is he my shepherd? My shepherd. I shall not want. We'll see you next week.